Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this uh, Align CCUS webinar on the reuse of hydrocarbon distillations for CCS. Uh, I will go through a 20 minute presentation on uh, CCS and the research that has been done uh, under the scope of the Align project. The Align research, the legal research that was conducted over the last two years, conduct, consists of two major pillars. A, a research into hydrocarbon legislation, especially the removal requirements under international and national law, and the legislation governing carbon storage at sea. In order to get the context straight, we have to first assess the state of affairs currently in the North Sea region. We see that uh, hydrocarbons exploration and exploitation has had a peak in the past. And we see now that a lot of uh, fields go out of productions and hydrocarbons operators have to consider removing the infrastructure consisting of platforms, wells, boreholes. On the other hand, unfortunately, we see that CCS industry and CCS activities in Europe are not uh, taking off as we want them to. And one major reason for this is the current relative low price for CO2 allowances under the EU ETS system. Currently, it's floating around 25 euros per ton, and ideally, this price has to triple. So for the coming decades, we expect that, for the coming years, with the coming decade, we expect that we won't see as much CCS activities in the North Sea as we would like. And the assumption is that forced carbon storage, it would be possible to use almost depleted oil fields and the unused platforms. Uh, one major uh, underlying uh, idea is that the reservoirs, which are, have been empty due to production, uh, offer suitable and safe storage uh, space for the permanent storage of CO2. The question is how we can we align oil and gas production together with the permanent storage of CO2. And one major question that we have to start with is when does the new activity of CCS start? And there are basically two uh, approaches. We can have direct reuse and then the reuse of the uh, infrastructure starts immediately when oil and gas activities have ceased. And this would be uh, possible if uh, the new CCS storage license holder is uh, ready to take over the reservoirs and the infrastructure for carbon storage. However, uh, we see currently that the CCS industry won't be taking off in the next decade. So we have to uh, take into consideration postponed reuse. This means that the offshore um, oil and gas infrastructure will be ineffective, in on, out of operation, no longer producing oil and gas, and will be reused at a later time. One major issue is what are you going to do with the infrastructure in the meantime? For example, if we would close off the reservoir by closing off the borehole and the well, it will impede later reuse possibilities because it then would require to later on drill a new well for the injection of CO2. And this creates what we call the temporal gap problem. There's an end, there's a gap between the end of hydrocarbon production and the start of carbon dioxide storage. And we can visualize this temporal gap by the following illustration. On the one hand, we have the offshore platforms, wells, reservoirs, and pipelines, and a potential carbon storage operator. Only this carbon storage operator cannot use the infrastructure straight away as there is no price incentive for him to start capturing, transporting and storing CO2. So from the CCS perspective industry, from the CCS industry perspective, they could use that infrastructure in 10 years times. However, the hydrocarbon operator is under the obligation to decommission tomorrow. And for that end, we need to understand better what this decommissioning obligation entails. Under international law, especially the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, there is an obligation to decommission offshore installations on the continental shelf of the coastal state. It's codified in Article 60 of UNCLOS. 
this provision has a long history and it can uh, boil down to either the complete removal of the installation or the partial removal. And in order to uh, decide whether the installation is going to be removed completely or partially, the IMO standards uh, provide more clarity. And these IMO standards dictate that installation under a specific num uh, number of specific circumstances can be partially uh, removed, thus leaving part of the installation in place. But that depends on the situation where the installation is located. For example, if the installation is located in shallow waters, then the installation has to be completely removed in order to not hinder shipping or fishing activities. If the installation is located in deep waters, then only the top part has to be decommissioned. Additionally, there is the issue of abandonment. Abandonment entails that a part of the installation uh, is being dumped at sea, it's being left in place. And this is governed by the OSPAR decision. And it's important to bear in mind that the decommissioning obligations covers installations and not necessarily pipelines. So the rules for how to decommission and abandon pipelines sometimes differs from the rules that cover installations. To make matters more complicated, there is no harmonized EU legislation on decommissioning. Therefore, the member states have to implement the UNCLOS provisions into national law and have to do that on an individual basis. This means that legislation differs per coastal states. To give an example, the Netherlands, which has a very shallow continental shelf, prescribes a complete removal of the installations. Norway, on the other hand, which has some deep parts uh, on the continental shelf, prescribes partial decommissioning in some issues. Additionally, there's also uncertainty uh, on reuse possibilities, because not all national legislation uh, open the door for reuse. Again, in the Netherlands, a decommissioning plan that governs the decommissioning activities has to be submitted to the minister, and the minister has to approve or disapprove this plan. The major criteria that the minister has to use when making his decision is whether is the decommissioning plan uh, in, will realize the safe decommissioning of the installation, the safe removal. It does not provide a door for prescribing reuse. The United Kingdom, on the other hand, has implemented the waste hierarchy into their decommissioning laws, meaning that an operator, when submitting his decommissioning plan, first has to consider whether the installation can be reused, and only if reuse is not an option, then the removal can be uh, presented. That means that decommissioning legislation and the possibilities for reuse differ in the um, states that we research, the Netherlands, the UK, and Norway. And that will also show when we consider the possible ways of dealing with the temporal gap. Then we have to move on to the three parties involved uh, and we have to balance their interest. Uh, we have the hydrocarbons license operator who has been producing oil and gas uh, through the infrastructure. We have the state and we have the future CCS storage license holder. So let's take a closer look at the interest of the different parties. First, the hydrocarbon license operator has signed up for hydrocarbon activities. It has a license to extract oil and gas and has been doing so uh, for a number of years. The activities of the hydrocarbons operator are regulated by the license the mining, under the mining law and the joint operating agreement that governs the joint venture uh, for the hydrocarbons activity. It's important to bear in mind that when considering the temporal gap, the hydrocarbon license operator cannot uh, take off and leave the installations in place because the installations uh, cannot be left unattended without anyone being responsible. Then we have the state and the state has a dual, a dual obligation. Firstly, they want to secure that uh, suitable locations for carbon storage are uh, safeguarded and 
made sure that these locations stay available. On the other hand, the state cannot simply take on uh, the responsibility for all um, offshore platforms and pipelines because that would impose excessive tax burdens on taxpayers. Because keeping an installation in place requires a significant amount of money for maintenance of the platform, the pipeline, and the well. And if we look at the position of the CCS storage license holder, we see that CCS is already risky enough. And that's why CCS activities are rather low in the EU at the moment. And the most important uh, things facing the CCS uh, storage license holder are the long-term liability and the financial security requirements. Then we have to consider who is responsible for the infrastructure during the temporal gap. Again, if we look at the position of the hydrocarbon license holder, he's not, uh, perhaps not willing to take on that responsibility because at the end of uh, the hydrocarbon production, what is the economic incentive to remain responsible for the platform? Only if there is financial compensation, he might be willing to take on this responsibility. On the other hand, there is no uh, new CO2 storage licensee in place. So can he pass the cost on to the uh, CO2 storage license holder? That's not sure at the moment. Then the remaining party who could be made responsible is the state. But again, how is the state uh, to take on this responsibility? And at this point, we can present the concept of the operator of last resort. Because the operator of last resort uh, will step in after hydrocarbons activities have ceased and will maintain the infrastructure until a new licensee has entered the picture to which he can pass on the infrastructure. There are a number of aspects we need to consider for this operator of last resort. Especially the questions are, who is going to be this party and how we're going to appoint it? So we have to take a number of steps. And the first step is to select the infrastructure for reuse. As I said, um, empty gas and oil reservoirs are suitable storage locations. And we have several hundreds of these reservoirs available in the North Sea region. It will be, however, uh, very unprofitable to keep all of the reservoirs open and available for CCS, especially if the CCS industry is expected to take off by 2030, meaning that we have to maintain a lot of infrastructure for a long period of time. And who is going to take on the responsibility? Because if the state takes over a platform and all of the other infrastructure, we won't send a civil servant offshore to maintain that platform. Someone specialized in offshore operations has to do that. But the most likely party to take on this responsibility are oil and gas companies because they have the knowledge of offshore activities. And especially the hydrocarbons operator who has been operating the reservoir. Because during the exploitation of the reservoir, a lot of knowledge on the um, characteristics of the reservoir have been gathered by this operator and it would be very wise to keep this knowledge and pass it on to the future CCS storage license holder. Next question is how are we going to select this operator of last resort? Are we going to organize a tender or are we going to just give the minister the possibility to just appoint a party? The way how you're going to select it also ties in with the business model for the operator of last resort. And in our view, the most likely case will be that this operator of last resort has to be funded through a subsidy scheme because taking over the infrastructure from the hydrocarbons operator and then trying to sell them uh, to the future CCS operator would always entail a loss for the operator of last resort because the infrastructure during the period that the operator of last resort owns it 
will of course deteriorate in the offshore environment due to wear and tear. And then we have to consider the duration of the operator's last resort activities. How long are, uh, are we willing to keep this operator of last resort in place? Because we have to remind ourselves that this operator of last resort is not really conducting an economic activity. It's just maintaining a platform and keeping a well open for a period of time so that the infrastructure may be reused at a later moment. So during that period, the operator of last resort doesn't really have a steady income. And uh, on the basis of economic and technical uh, assessments, it has to be decided how long this operator of last resort can maintain the infrastructure uh, at a cost efficient manner. Because keeping an operator of last resort in place for a few decades would of course not really benefit later CCS activities. Then the income of the operator of last resort, as I said, the most likely income stream would be a subsidy screen because a, a purchase and sales construction whereby the infrastructure is uh, acquired and then later is passed on to the CCS operator will not really be a business case. But of course, it has to be decided where this income stream, the subsidy stream comes from. And of course, this is, has to be decided on the member state level. Then there's the important question, is it only maintenance or has the operator of last resort, has, to, has he to do more? Because you could well take the position that this operator of last resort could also uh, prepare the infrastructure for later CCS activities uh, by removing unnecessary equipment or maybe already installing some of the equipment necessary for later CCS activities. Then there is the issue of passing on the removal obligation because when the operator of last resort acquires the infrastructure from the hydrocarbons operator, the responsibility to decommission already also passes on. This means that if for some reason no later CCS operator enters into the picture, the operator of last resort bears also the removal obligation and the costs that come with it. Obviously, when a CCS storage operator has been appointed and he acquires the infrastructure, then the removal obligation passes on to the CCS storage license holder. And finally, very important, because the North Sea is riddled with a number of hundreds of reservoirs and thousands of kilometers of pipe band that can be reused, uh, the regulators, regulators of the North Sea countries have to enter in some sort of cross-border cooperation, especially in on the area of site selection. Which reservoirs uh, do you want to keep open and which infrastructure do you want to keep in place? And especially if you are looking at clustered infrastructure in a border region, for example, uh, on the border between the UK and Norway, then both regulators have to enter into agreement and to decide which infrastructure is going to be um, allocated for reuse and how is the operator of last resort going to deal with that. And this brings us to basically two questions. First question is, what can national governments do to stimulate the reuse of existing hydrocarbon infrastructure? Well, obviously the first recommendation would be to support CCS, the CCS industry, because the most efficient way of reusing existing infrastructure is obviously direct reuse. So that would be an obligation for the uh, member states to assess how CCS activities in general can be stimulated. On the other hand, we also see that not all hydrocarbons, uh, not all mining law is uh, sufficiently clear on how reuse can take place. And in that area, uh, the member states can improve their mining laws. Second question, what can be done at a global level to promote the reuse of infrastructure? Well, in this area, you could say that the international uh, rules on decommissioning and abandonment 
are in some areas a little unclear. For example, uh, the IMO standards prescribe decommissioning, but nowhere in the IMO standards is being made clear when is decommissioning to, to be initiated. And that creates a bit of legal uncertainty for hydrocarbons operators and regulators that want to consider reuse. So we see that uh, a lot of improvements can be made um, to facilitate the reuse, but we can conclude with a bit of optimism that reuse is possible under the existing legislation. And the most important yeah, factor will be um, when is the CCS industry in Europe really going to take off? And with that note, uh, I want to conclude this webinar. I hope you have uh, find it uh, interesting. And if you want to learn more about the legal research that has been done under the scope of the Align projects, you can visit the Align website and find more information there. I wish you a very good day. Bye.